Well, I'm recording about four o'clock in the afternoon. I can't wait any later in the day to uh, teach the lesson, to preach the meditation. Uh, can't wait any later and still get it on uh, Facebook in time. I try to have it there, five, five thirty anyway. Uh, we're on our way to Knoxville. We'll go through Knoxville, uh, probably over toward Asheville. Then, uh, then again, we may go up Interstate 81 on our way to Salisbury, North Carolina. Begin tomorrow morning preaching the Word of God there at Canaan Baptist Church. But it is going to be only a Facebook Live revival. I think the preacher said there had been some cases of the virus in the church and uh, uh, for the sake of safety uh, they have chosen to do that and Debbie and I of course are fine with however God leads the pastor pray for the revival this week uh, we're going to the book of Acts and of course we're just continuing in chapter 16 wasn't that exciting yesterday, our last lesson. A lady named Lydia got saved. A jailer uh, in the prison system of the Roman Empire, he got saved. And their households, their families, households can involve their servants as well. Uh, and then we learn in verse 32 then they spake, that would be Paul and Silas, unto him. The him there would be the Philippian jailer, a new convert to the Lord Jesus. Then they spake unto him the word of the Lord. And Luke says, and to all that were in his house. What an eventful night, what an exciting night. I doubt anybody got a wink of sleep. Earthquake at midnight. A man gets saved uh, and his household is hearing that. When it says they spake unto them, it uses the verb laleo just in conversational tones. They're teaching him what's happened. They're teaching him a little more about the beauties of the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 33. And he took them, the jailer took them. Remember, Paul and Silas, their backs are bleeding. No doubt their muscles are cramping. They have been uh, locked up in stocks for hours. He took them the same hour of the night, same hour he got saved, I reckon, and washed their stripes. That's a tender little word, washed, bathed. Oh, let me do this. You'd think he'd let his wife do it, but the, Luke says no, the text says he did it. The jailer wanted to be kind to those that have told him about Jesus, washed their stripes. That noun there for stripes means wounds. It really gives us the word plagues. Remember the plagues of Egypt, that would be Hebrew instead of Greek, but the same idea. He is bathing the whelps, the cuts across their back, their backs, two men where they had been so mercilessly beaten. And then he, he not only washed their stripes, honored them any way that he could and was baptized in the nighttime and was baptized. Baptizo, the, uh, the verb is in the passive voice. He didn't baptize himself, uh, Paul or Silas. But Paul wasn't real keen. In fact, once he said to the Corinthians, I, I don't think I baptized any of you. Paul probably let some of his co-workers do the baptizing, and why not? Baptism doesn't save you. Get me an amen. Baptism doesn't help save you, and it doesn't keep you saved. It's an act of obedience. He was baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. In the name of the Father, 
the Son and the Holy Spirit, just like Jesus commissioned in Matthew 28, 19, and 20. Uh, he, wait a minute, it wasn't just the jailer baptized. Apparently his wife, apparently any children at home, he and all his, he and all his were baptized. And then Luke adds the word straightway, immediately. Back then, you get saved, here's water, Acts 8, eunuch, what doth hinder me from being baptized? They would baptize them immediately. Sometimes now we wait a while, don't we? I guess we want to be sure it was genuine. <laughs> they knew back then this man's salvation is genuine. Verse 34. After they'd been... Uh, remember, there is a river flowing quite nearby Philippi. That's where Paul and Silas went down by the riverside where Lydia got saved, where the Lord opened her heart. Baptism's over, verse 34. And he brought them into his house. Y'all come home with me. He brought them into his house and he set meat before them. He set something before them to eat. I read a note. This is not original with me. Somebody said, one commentator said, this is the first time that food is mentioned, Paul and Silas, since the Jerusalem conference. They now, without worrying about somebody accosting them or accusing them, they can eat any kind of meat they choose as long as it's not been strangled, if it's been killed and the blood drained out of it. I hope you'll smile. Paul could have him a piece or two of bacon if he wants to. Or a pork chop. Or if he's got some shrimp. I don't know they'd serve that in the middle. He brought them into his house. And he set meat before them. To set meat, that particular construction. Uh, he brought them to his table. A word that means four legs. He brought them to his table. Implying there was food. He may have had a cook on staff. He, he, his wife may have been a delicious uh, home, homemaker and had to, they set meat before them and they rejoiced and they rejoiced I love that they rejoiced believing in God. That verb rejoice let me tell you about it. It means to leap up and down he is one happy jailer. And he'll get to keep his job because none of the prisoners escaped. Hallelujah. If one of them had, he could be killed. He rejoiced believing in God. When he got saved, when he believed in Jesus, and that is believing in God, Jesus is God, it is a perfect participle. Let me show you what it means. It's, it's lovely. He believed on him tonight. Two hours ago, whatever it was, three hours ago, and he's still believing on him now. And he'll be believing on him tomorrow. And he'll be believing on him day as long as he lives. He will be acting and living upon that moment when he believed on the Lord Jesus Christ as his Savior. Would you notice something? He no sooner got saved and he wanted to love the brethren. <laughs> he, he, what must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus. I will. I do. Now. I, can I wash your stripes? Can I do something to relieve your suffering? By this shall all men... John 13, 35. Jesus said it. By this shall all men know you're my disciples. Here's how they'll know you're saved. Here's how they'll know you belong to me. If you love the brethren and boy he sure is loving the brethren verse 35 we're going to verse 40 and when it was day that little verb was I can't talk about every verb but it's it impresses me genomai genomai what, what does it mean preacher 
when the day was born. A new day has come to pass. A new day has exploded upon the scene. You know what that reminds me of? This is the day the Lord hath made. He will rejoice, be saved, and be glad. And it reminds me of this. Great is thy faithfulness, lamentations, Thy mercies are new every morning, dear Lord. And when it was day, the magistrates, that's the crowd that beat Paul and Silas, the magistrates. It uses the word strategy. It's a military word. It's a polemic word. It's a, it can be a police, a law, and for the magistrates uh, sent the sergeants what's going on here the magistrates sent this the word there for sergeants those are the men that held the rods that beat Paul and beat Silas uh, they also were the sergeants at arms uh, they were the uh, uh, they were the men that would carry the insignia of these big shots these godless magistrates uh, they uh, the magistrates sent the, the, the sergeants say let those men go. I looked it up. It is an imperative verb. Let those men go. And the word for men, anthropos. To these magistrates, Paul and Silas, are they're just Mr. Average every day. They're nobody special. Just another man. Just another human being. Take it or leave it. In God's eyes, they're special. In God's eyes, they're ambassadors. In the eyes of the jailer, they're pretty, pretty important too. They won. They are the ones that told him about the Lord Jesus. Let those men go. It sounds to me like they know they beat them illegally. It sounds to me like they sort of want to hush, hush, hush. You boys, get on out of town. Get out of our hair. We could be in trouble with Rome the way we've abused you. Let these men go. Verse 36, this is important. And the keeper of the prison, the newly born again jailer, told this saying to Paul. Why, uh, Paul, I don't understand it. You're a free man. The magistrates have sent to let you go. Apostello, to send you away from here. Now, therefore, you can depart. Ek erkamai. You can go out from this jail. Uh, uh, all charges are to me. You can depart and go in peace. There'll be no posse chasing you. Uh, there'll be no policemen. There'll be no soldiers uh, in pursuit. You can go in peace. Watch this. It's a surprise. But Paul said... Paul said, listen to what he's going to say. Paul said unto them, they have beaten us openly. Oh, i got to tell you about that verb, beat. It literally means to skin alive. They have beaten the skin off our backs. We have bled profusely. They have beaten us openly. Openly, we call it an adverb, demos, in front of all the people. They shamed us. They mocked us uncondemned. Oh my, what a verb. Uh, let, let me akatakrino. What does it mean, preacher Bagel? Without a court session. They have done this illegally. Uh, uh, no habeas corpus. Uh, no, uh, no rule of law uh, was in effect here. Uncondemned. They didn't even call the judge in. And now they want to just brush it aside and let us go. We are Roman citizens. Paul didn't tell that the night before. We, comma, uncondemned. They've beaten us being Romans. And then they threw us into the jail. Those two words, being Romans, being Roman citizens, would have frightened these magistrates to death. They have beaten a Roman citizen. You don't do that.
to beat a Roman citizen is that they themselves now can go to jail. They have violated a principle of the Roman Emperor. We being Romans. And then they throw us into jail and now they want to kick us out. Ek balo. Now they want to throw us out. No. Nay. Verily. Paul said, I'm not leaving. We're not leaving. You let them come and you let them come and uh, they can escort let them come themselves and fetch us out. Paul very seldom stands up for himself but here he does paul is deter now now why didn't paul say back when they were ready to beat him no 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 where romans said it could have been the uproar the riot he would have never been heard they were like an obsessive mob to beat paul and silas it it, it could have been paul was willing to take the whipping willing to take the beating trusting God to through their suffering win other folks to Jesus if that was his strategy it sure did work and it worked well the jailer got say Paul didn't know about an earthquake but God knew about it Paul is willing to suffer for Jesus sake it could be that uh, uh, let them come and fetch us out. Verse 38. Paul is using some diplomacy. Paul, and, and, and now why does Paul want them to be escorted out with dignity and with honor? Paul was shamed. Silas was embarrassed no end. Stripped their clothes off and beat them and throw them in prison and they had broken absolutely no law. By the way, that shows the power of the men who owned that little slave girl, the men who owned that little fortune teller. They must have had some cloud in that city. They got the authorities to do something illegal just so Paul and Silas would be punished. No, Paul said, let them come and fetch us out. Verse 38, and they told the sergeants these words, and the sergeants ran back and told the magistrates, and they feared for Beo. They got scared. They got they got terribly afraid. They feared. They got a phobia when they heard that they were Romans. When they heard they were Civitas. How would they pronounce it in Latin? Kiwitas, Romanos, Sum. I am a Roman. I am a Roman citizen. Oh no. What have we done? Oh, we have spoken unadvisedly. We have acted rashly. They can bring charges against us and we can lose our positions in the city of Philippi. You better be sure they got down there in a hurry. They got to make peace if they can. Verse 39. And they came. They came. They came immediately. They came humbly. Uh, they came with. Uh, they came and besought them. Parakaleo, begged them, urged them. No longer commanding, no longer threatening of whipping them with rods. They they came and besought them. You've heard me define parakaleo before. Uh, they came up beside them and like they put their arm around and said, now, uh, uh, we, we came as close to apology as one's going to get from this crowd of wicked men. We, we, we need you to go on. We, we, uh, we didn't know you were Roman citizens. And they brought them out, brought them out of the area of the prison, brought them out of the jailer's house and desired them urge them this is not uh, parakaleo this is reo the words flowed out of their mouth uh, the word said almost please 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 would you depart out of the city let me say something about studying the new testament you're going to come across the same vocabulary words over and over again parakaleo ek 
Echomai, Theos, the name for God. Preacher, why? There are only 5,400, that's a round figure, 5,400 words in the Greek New Testament. That is not a huge vocabulary. The Holy Ghost uses words again and again and again, and it makes it, we Greek students, we, it makes it easier for us. We pick up these words. We learn the meaning of these words. Would y'all please, they desired them to leave town. Verse 40. And they went out. They left the prison area. The jailer said, and they went out of the prison and entered into the house of Lydia. They didn't leave town. Now get out of our way. You have treated us wrongly. They left the prison. They left the jailer's house. And they go to the house of Lydia. Remember that wealthy lady who got saved? Remember that lady who has servants? Remember that lady whose house has many rooms? And when they had seen the brethren, we're not leaving here till we see the church, the little nucleus of, of, of Christians that have been saved. When they had seen the brethren, I do. It means they saw them. They recognized them. They shook their hands. They knew who they were. Maybe the little slave girl got saved. Now the jailer and his wife and family have been saved. Lydia and her household and no telling who else has been there were some other ladies down by uh, the riverside when they uh, went out of the prison and they entered into Lydia's house and they had seen the brethren a Delphos a group of people born out of the same womb the womb of the grace of God and the goodness of God and then they comforted the brethren there is Parakaleo again let me Put my arm around you. Let me love you. Let me encourage you to keep living for Jesus. Let me encourage you to learn the Word of God. Let me encourage you to uh, love the brethren here. 5,400 words. Barakaleo comes often. And they encourage it. I, I like this line. I read it as I studied. Two men, Paul and Silas, who badly needed comforting. Backs still raw. And instead, they are comforting. They are loving. They're brothers and their sisters in Christ, the newborn believers. Hallelujah. That is leadership. And they comforted their brethren. And then they did what they were at. And then they departed. Then they left Philippi. But they left a little church behind they left some believers behind. They left some folks behind that are going to be able to serve God. And Paul loves this church. This church keeps up with Paul, it looks like, in all of his travels. This church will send gifts to Paul. Uh, the book of Philippians, uh, the fourth chapter is Paul's thank you letter back to this church because they were so good to him. Sent him uh, love offerings all along in his ministry. Then we'll go tomorrow night into Acts 17, verse 1. They leave Philippi and they go to a place called Thessalonica, a city called Thessalonica. And a bunch of people get saved there and a church is started. And then we have First and Second Thessalonians to be written to them on down the road. Philippi, church started. Thessalonica, church started people being saved opposition the devil is fighting but people being saved to the glory of god that's the nature of paul's travels paul's missionary journeys hallelujah for the progress of the gospel let's pray preacher what are we going to pray tonight let me tell you what god is laid on my heart. It is a verse of scripture in 1 Samuel 7. 1 Samuel 7 verse 9. And Samuel cried unto the Lord for Israel. And the Lord heard him. Samuel this prayed, cried unto the Lord for Israel. And the Lord heard him. Let me explain that. He cried unto the Lord for his nation. 
for his country and the Lord heard him. Did you get that reference? 1 Samuel 7, 9. Tonight, we're going to pray not for Israel. Nothing wrong with that. Good idea. We're going to pray for our nation. We're going to pray for our country. We're going to pray for America. I think in these weeks leading up to the election, every Christian needs to pray, needs to pray intently for our land. America's turning against God. For the first time in my life, I'm 74 years old, for the first time in my life, there is a political party that has adopted for their platform the sins of Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1 three times says God gave them up. God gave them over. I really don't have time to preach it. Romans 1 verse 24. Romans 1 verse 26. Romans 1 verse 28. Can I summarize it? We'll study it sometime maybe. They wouldn't obey God. America's not obeying. And God turned them over to sexual rebellion. God turned them over to what they would call sexual liberty. I'll do anything I want to with my body. That is the sexual revolution of the 60s and the 70s. And there is a political party in America today that has adopted it. Anything on the in their plan, anything moral right with God or not, anything moral is okay. Next, God turned them over and said men begin to have sex with men and women with women. I guess I better read it in the King James. God gave them up to vile affections. Women changed the natural use into that which is against nature. Women with women and men also with men, burning in their lust, men one toward another. There is a political party in America who has adopted this perverted lifestyle and made it part of their platform. They're in favor. They're in favor of that violation of God's law. Preacher, what's the third thing God turned them over to? Verse 28. A reprobate mind. A reprobate. Let me explain what that means. A mind that can no longer think. A mind that can no longer logically reason. A mind, listen to me, that will call right wrong and wrong right. A mind that will say the police are not good, the police are bad. A mind that will say, oh, I can't go into it. A Christian actually has no choice as we approach the election in November of this year. One political party, all the sins of Romans 1, flaunting rebellion against the eyes of God. That's their platform. And the other political party, at least, is against killing babies. At least is not for promoting sexual perversion at least believes there's still a God in it at least still loves Israel we ought to pray for our nation and our brother Bible you're about to get political no I'm staying biblical I'm staying spirit I will not vote for anybody who is against the things of Almighty God may we pray Father, we pray for our nation. We pray for our land. I pray for our president. Oh God, he's a hated man. I pray for our president. Would you keep him? Would you bless him? Would you give him wisdom? God, he's not done everything right. But, and, and by the way, somebody that's about to cut me off, I pray for every president we ever had. I prayed for the last one. I prayed for the one before that. I prayed for the one. I don't agree with them, but I prayed for them. I'm supposed to pray for all that are in authority, and I'm sure going to pray for this one. God be with our president. God be with our nation. God, wake up us Christians. Help us to realize the, uh, the decision. God, save America. God, bless America. 
God help America to turn from the reprobate mind that's being uh, promoted by the media, to turn from uh, uh, sexual promiscuity, to turn from sexual perversion, and to come back, revive our land, to turn back to Almighty God. I pray for my country. I pray for my land. And God, those reprobates, those who hate God, those who want to destroy democracy, those who want to destroy righteousness, move them out of office. God, I pray you'll expel them. Send them confusion. Send them, uh, send them, Lord, uh, send them your judgment if need be. God, save America. God, bless our land. God, turn us and draw us back to thee, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm sure I've made some enemies, but I'm praying for my country like Samuel prayed for his country in 1 Samuel 7, 9. Let's pray for America. In the Bible text, what stood out? What did you learn? What is God going to use to minister to your heart through those verses. The last paragraph, really, of Acts 16. Tomorrow night, Acts 17. If you watched it, let me know. If it was a blessing, let me know. And uh, if you agree with me, pray for America. I especially need to know that. I think we're in Knoxville, Tennessee. Pray for us as we drive. My wife is driving. It'll be my turn again soon. Uh, pray for the revival. God bless each of you is our sincere prayer.